Hey everybody, welcome back. We are reading from We Are Power, How Nonviolent Activism Changes the World. I am Todd Huzak Lowy. This is part two of chapter one about Gandhi and Indian independence. And so the conflict continued in this fashion for another five years. New discriminatory laws, protests, imprisonment, and negotiations leading to possible compromises that were then undermined by a new batch of unfair laws. Though he himself hadn't been to the land of his birth for years, word of Gandhi's leadership and accomplishments was spreading back home in India. And with every day that passed, he became more and more convinced that Satyagraha contained within itself boundless power. Quote, a more reliable and more honorable method of fighting injustice than any which has heretofore been adopted, he wrote. In the spring of 1913, a new hardline immigration bill was drafted by the South African government that made it clear Indian interests would never truly be honored in this ongoing struggle. Among other things, it seriously restricted the rights of Indians to move from one colony to another. It also failed to repeat a three-pound tax, a significant sum imposed on Indian workers who chose to remain in South Africa after their labor contracts, which had first brought them to the country, expired. Last, it failed to weigh in on a conflict stemming from yet another recent discriminatory legal decision, according to which traditional Hindi and Muslim marriages would not be recognized. In response to this bill, a new Satragaha campaign was set in motion. On September 15th, 16 Indians marched to enter Transvaal illegally. Though this method of nonviolent protest had been tried before, this time around, some of the Satyagrahis were women, something unheard of back then, since in, quote, India itself, the idea that women could participate in popular social movements was out of the question. Gender roles were quite restrictive in Indian society at this time. Middle-class women, for instance, quote, were not supposed to leave the house unescorted. But during an earlier trip to London to advocate for his people before members of parliament and the, even Lord Elgin, Secretary of State for the Colonies, Gandhi had crossed paths with the British suffragettes, whom we'll learn more about in the next chapter. And he greatly admired their own nonviolent campaign aimed at winning the right to vote. A truly mass nonviolent movement, he realized, would require the participation of men and women. On September 23rd, all 16 marchers, including Gandhi's wife, Kasturba, were sentenced to three months in prison. Gandhi himself, not among those who marched, published two powerful pieces in Indian opinion, both calling for all Indians, especially the poor, a group he had not singled out before, to now join the struggle. It was no longer enough for the wealthier vanguard of the Indian community to lead by example. The time had come to grow the movement. And by focusing on the tax, which was most difficult for the poor to pay, Gandhi was able to mobilize them as well. The combination of women's participation and his appeal to the poor sent a potent shockwave through the Indian community. 2,000 workers in Natal went on strike. New marches were organized, many more activists were arrested, and soon thousands upon thousands of Indian laborers all over South Africa, in sugar plantations and coal mines, on railways and ships, were going on strike. Farming was interrupted. A main source of energy grew harder to come by, all while key modes of transportation for moving people and things became unreliable. Without the work of Indian laborers, the country could not function. While, yet another, while leading yet another march in November, Gandhi himself was arrested and sent to jail. When he was released in December, he appeared like a new man. The London trade lawyer had rejected his western suit and tie for the simple clothes of an indentured servant. Now barefoot, he had shaved most of his head as well. And here's an image of what Gandhi looked like. You can see, though he still looks somewhat young, he now is beginning to resemble the Gandhi that is famous in images of him as an older man. Why? Gandhi's goal was independence, what he called Swaraj, a term meaning freedom both external and internal. Swaraj means not just enduring political rights, but also having the ability to control who you are deep inside. And this inner Swaraj couldn't be given to anyone, it had to be claimed. 
Gandhi now believed that Indians could only acquire this inner Swaraj by rejecting Western ways. In years to come, he would spin his own cloth called Khadi, dressing himself in simple swaths of fabric rather than wearing imported clothes. Swaraj was the goal, the end to which he and his people were struggling, and Satyagraha was the means, the way they'd get there, because, as he wrote, quote, only fair means can produce fair results. This latest, most extensive Satyagraha campaign led to more negotiations between Smuts and Gandhi. The eventual outcome of their meeting was the Indians' Relief Bill, which was passed in late June 1914. This bill abolished the tax for those who wished to remain in South Africa and recognized Indian marriages. Though the white leadership was still nevertheless marching headlong toward the discriminatory system of apartheid that would rule South Africa until the 1990s, Gandhi was satisfied with the terms of this settlement. More than this, he was eager to finally return to India as he felt his work in South Africa was done. After Gandhi departed from South Africa once and for all on July 18, 1914, a relieved smuts reflected, quote, The saint has left our shores. I sincerely hope forever. Gandhi now saw Satyagraha as perhaps the mightiest instrument on earth, in his words. But could it succeed in India? After all, it was one thing to mobilize 150,000 immigrants to demand greater rights. But what about leading 300 million colonial subjects, whose country, India, was the, quote, jewel in the crown of the British Empire? Could Satyagraha bring about the ultimate Swaraj, a truly independent India? On the morning of March 12, 1930, Gandhi and 78 of his followers left Ahmedabad, a village in western India, and began walking due south. Gandhi, now dressed only in khadi, which he had spun himself, held a 54-inch bamboo walking staff with an iron tip. The group's destination was the town of Dandi, on the coast of the Arabian Sea, some 240 miles away. What would they do once they arrived? Make salt, by extracting it from the natural salt works that line this stretch of the Indian coast. Gandhi had been back in India for 15 years by now. During this time, he had traveled throughout the vast countryside again and again in an effort to understand his people, who spoke dozens of different languages and followed just as many traditions. He had worked with a host of political leaders, each with a different vision for how to end almost 200 years of British rule in India. And he had imported Satyagraha to his homeland. Often the outcomes were promising, such as in the Champaran region in 1917, when poor farmers held protests and went on strike in order to win better conditions from the British landlords who controlled their fields. But not every experiment was successful. In 1922, a non-cooperation campaign deteriorated into violence as an angry mob trapped 22 policemen in their station and then burned it to the ground, killing everyone inside. Gandhi had spent some of this time in prison and for a number of years retreated from politics altogether, unsure if he could truly lead his nation or if its people even wanted him to. But by 1928, it had become clear that only Gandhi could unite India behind him. His simple dress, his clear moral vision, and his history of successfully challenging white colonial rule made him a singular figure. There was no one like him. More established politicians, such as Jawaharlal Nehru, who would eventually become India's first prime minister, aligned themselves with Gandhi and promoted him as a unique leader who could get results both within and beyond the world of conventional politics. In 1928, an 11-member committee of prominent Indian leaders drafted the Nehru Committee Report, which rejected British plans to maintain control of India instead called for something called dominion status, a type of independence. Gandhi announced that a civil disobedience campaign would begin if the British did not accept the report. The British rejected its terms. Gandhi withdrew to his ashram, a religious retreat, in order to contemplate the form the coming Satyagraha would take. He greatly feared another outburst of violence, and he knew that any failure, whether from disunity or lack of impact, would spell disaster for the independence movement as a whole. 
the country waited anxiously for six weeks, during which time Gandhi remained holed up in his small, Spartan hut, listening closely for guidance from his, quote, inner voice. Eventually, the answer came to him. Salt. For almost a hundred years, the British held a monopoly on Indian salt. Indians could neither produce nor sell this most basic of staples. The British levied a salt tax as well, which Indians naturally despised, as it made salt in India, quote, four times as expensive as in England. Even so, there were many more pressing features of British rule Gandhi could have chosen to oppose. But, as Gandhi wrote, the simple injustice of this tax made it a perfect target. And here's what Gandhi had to say about it. Next to air and water, salt is perhaps the greatest necessity of life. It is the only condiment of the poor. There is no article like salt outside water by taxing which the state can reach even the starving millions, the sick, the maimed, and the utterly helpless. The tax constitutes, therefore, the most inhuman poll tax that ingenuity of man can devise. Gandhi had chosen his target for Satyagraha. He would violate the salt laws by making salt himself. But before actually committing civil disobedience, he reached out to his opponent, Lord Baron Irwin, the British Viceroy in India and head of the entire colonial enterprise, with a remarkable letter on March 2nd that once again showed the incredible combination of determination and kindness marking Gandhi's approach to conflict. And as you listen to this, keep in mind how politicians today talk to each other and how Gandhi talks to his adversary. Dear friend, Gandhi began, before embarking on civil disobedience and taking the risk I have dreaded to take all these years, I would fain approach you and find a way out. I cannot intentionally hurt anything that lives, much less fellow human beings, even though they may do the greatest wrong to me and mine. Whilst, therefore, I hold the British rule to be a curse, I do not intend to harm a single Englishman. Gandhi continued explaining why he thought British rule was a curse and explaining how it exploited Indians poor, India's poor, particularly through the salt tax, in order to create yet more riches for the British. To make this clear to Irwin personally, Gandhi noted that the viceroy's salary was 5,000 times greater than the average Indian made in a year. Such a system, Gandhi wrote, quote, deserves to be summarily scrapped. The coming Satyagraha campaign was thus intended to dismantle this system. Quote, Nothing but unadulterated nonviolence can check the organized violence of the British government, Gandhi told Irwin. This nonviolent approach, Gandhi hoped, would also, quote, convert the British people and thus make them see the wrong they have done to India. I do not seek to harm your people. I want to serve them even as I want to serve my own. In closing, Gandhi again asked for Irwin's cooperation so they might find an alternative to civil disobedience. If Irwin could bring about the, quote, removal of these evils, it would open the way for a real conference between equals. But, Gandhi continued, quote, if you cannot see your way to deal with these evils, and my letter makes no appeal to your heart, on the eleventh day of this month, I shall proceed with such co-workers of the ashram as I can to disregard the provisions of salt laws. End quote. Lord Irwin's private secretary sent a brief note in reply stating that the viceroy regretted Gandhi's decision to violate the law. Gandhi and his fellow unarmed Satyagrahis, all men, probably because men and women gathering together in public was still rare in India back then, walked approximately 10 miles each day, down winding dirt roads that ran between one small village and another. The days were hot, so they marched only during the cooler mornings and evenings. Still, some struggled with this arduous task and fell sick. But the 60-year-old Gandhi, despite being the oldest marcher, and sleeping only four hours a night due to his many responsibilities, looked, as the perplexed viceroy put it, quote, regrettably hale and hearty. In each village where they stopped, Gandhi spoke to excited villagers, educating them about nonviolence and reminding them, as he first wrote back in 1909, that, quote, the English have not taken India, we have given it to them. 
He didn't ask the locals for money to support the campaign. Instead, he implored them to recognize the great power they together held and to prepare themselves to commit civil disobedience after he himself soon broke the law. Gandhi encouraged local officials without whose assistance the imperial government could not operate to resign. Approximately 300 village leaders along the way did just that. They were beginning to understand their crucial place in the answer to a question that had long mystified the people of India. How can a British imperial force of only 100,000 control a population of 300 million? The answer was Indian cooperation, through which India had, quote, given their country to the British. Though they steadily passed from village to village, the procession didn't exactly leave these villages behind. Instead, members of each village joined them, as the number of marches swelled from just under 80 to several thousand, including many young people and women. The constant publicity each visit to a village generated propelled the excitement out across India, transforming a winding line of marchers into a nationwide drama. The country, which had already waited weeks for Gandhi to choose the form of the coming Satyagraha campaign, now held its breath with anticipation as the marchers steadily neared the coast. Would they march all the way to Dandi, or would Gandhi be arrested first? If he reached the shore, would he actually dare to break the law? 